Welcome to the YD3 Show. I'm your host, Dave McHugh, and for those who don't know me, I'm the broadcast director for D3Sports.com and its network of websites, including D3 Football, D3 Hoops, D3 Hockey, and D3 Baseball, among others. I'm also the host of Hoopsville, the only show dedicated to Division III basketball in the entire world. We are starting a new venture in conjunction with the NCAA in hopes of bringing you the stories of Division III. The YD3 show will tackle lots of things, mainly off the fields and courts, talking about those student athletes who are not only excelling on the field, but also excelling in the classroom and excelling in their communities. Also talk to coaches and programs and athletics departments who are doing bigger and better things to provide better opportunities for their student athletes and better opportunities for their schools and communities. These are important stories and sometimes are the driving reason for why students come to Division III, the biggest division in the entire NCAA. We hope to tackle those stories and give you a point of view that you may not realize is going on. The entire YD3 movement. Why are student athletes choosing to come to Division III? And what are they giving back to that decision? What are they giving back to their schools and their communities? And of course, how are they doing with their teams. We won't necessarily talk about championships in field hockey or volleyball, basketball, football, baseball, softball, and uh, softball and all the rest of the sports out there, but we will talk about what is going on on those fields in terms of how these student athletes are interacting with each other and how they are making an impact in their world. There are many student athletes who have played in Division III who have gone on to do incredible things We'll also talk to some of those, a say where are they now type segment, and talk to those, an astronaut who graduated from Cornell maybe, a former senator from Maine who went to Bowdoin. Little items like that to give you an idea of why Division III is so important to those who take part in it, whether they are administrators, coaches, students, or even families, or those like ourselves who cover them on a daily basis. We'll also tackle the major issues surrounding Division III. Find out what is going to be voted on at the convention and how that will impact student athletes and, of course, the fans. We'll talk about what is, needs to be dealt with in the future years, like budgets, recruiting, and other items that will have a major impact on the experiences and the championships of Division III. We will talk to those who are up in the higher offices of the NCAA throughout the year. We'll also talk to those in different athletics departments. We are currently here at Stevenson University because I felt it was important to start this show at a Division III school, and Stevenson was rather t relatively close. However, you'll see the show a lot in our own studios as well, which also are the studios for Hoopsville. We'll also, when we have that opportunity, travel to get stories ourselves, and we hope that you, the, either the student, the uh, administrator, somebody in an athletics department or at a school, can share your stories with us. Use the hashtag YD3. Contact us and let us know what you think is an important story to cover. We're going to do this show once a month. It will not be live necessarily. We will pre-produce this show and, and release it at once a month, about the third week of every month, we hope. We realize this show is just a little bit late for September as we're about to start October. But we hope you get an opportunity to see these stories. We're not going to be able to tell every story that we get. We'll certainly try and tell quite a few. We'll also have some special shows, like in December when we travel down to Salem, Virginia for the football championships. The Gallardi Trophy is always given out two days before the championship game. We have aired it here on D3Sports.com and d3football.com for, for several years. We hope to take it to the next level by adding the YD3 moniker and talk about why it is so important and such a major award in Division III and really in the NCAA. So those are a lot of the topics that we'll cover monthly here on the YD3 show and we will do these monthly even in the summer. Because there's so many stories to talk about. And student athletes who then leave the field and over their summer breaks might go and make an impact in their communities or other communities around the world. And we'll talk about those stories throughout. Again, if you want to have stories to share with us, please do so. Email me and we'll put a graphic up at the bottom. Dave.McHugh at D3Sports.com is one easy way to do it. Of course, use the hashtag YD3, which many people use to this day anyway. Today, on this show, for the month of September, we're going to tackle two different things. The first one, we will sit down with the Vice President of Division Three, Dan Dutcher, 
for what has become an annual State of Division Three chat between Dan and myself. The last couple of times we've done this, we've done them near the end of the year, the end of basketball seasons. We felt it decided it really needed to move towards the beginning of the academic year, and so we have an opportunity, traveled out to Indianapolis to talk with Dan Dutcher, and we have a, a lengthy interview with him, talking about everything from budgets to recruiting to in, votes that will be coming up at the convention that are important and other items that are impacting Division Three at this very moment to get you an idea of what is going on at the offices. We'll also talk about Cortland football and their incredible, incredible movement with bone marrow uh, registration and donation. It's an incredible story that doesn't deserve a quick wrap up, but we'll talk to those involved at Cortland about how this has come around and how it is still impacting their athletics department and community to this day. So those are the stories we'll talk about this month. Most months we'll talk about a few extras, but because the interview with Dan Dutcher is such a lengthy one, we only have so much time and we don't want to make this too lengthy. So with that note, we will send it to break. And when we come back, I talk to Dan Dutcher, Vice President for Division Three. There's a lot of issues to talk about, including a budget shortfall and how they're trying to find ways to make sure that the championship experience for the student athletes does not change while they still make sacrifices elsewhere to balance the budget. That's all coming up right here on the YD3 Show. What makes D3 special is the ability to participate in my team and within the broader community. The perfect ending to a perfect season. Being a D3 student athlete has completely expanded my life. I learned how to lead. I really found a voice. What time is it? It's, it's more about the experience rather than just a sport itself. Without the experience of being a Division III student athlete, I wouldn't be the person who I am today. NCAA Division III. Discover. Develop. Dedicate. Division three schools offer academic scholarships instead of athletic scholarships. This really puts the focus that the student athlete needs to maintain that GPA. I did receive a non-athletic scholarship upon entering uh, school. I got the presidential scholarship, which was huge for me. I think there's more opportunities for academic scholarships in Division three. A lot of people pick schools just based on the sport and don't get that experience. Being a Division three athlete and developing my leadership skills has definitely put my name out there and helped me get more recognition on campus, but more recognition nationwide. I did win the Jostens Trophy, which is based on leadership, academics, and then how well you do on the court. I'm also the Schwartz Scholar of my class. Schwartz Scholarship is basically a scholarship that is given to a student who's identified as a likely leader. In the other day, it won't matter how they play on the field, it will matter how they do in the classroom. And welcome back to the YD3 Show. I am Dave McHugh, and I am here at NCAA headquarters in Indianapolis. Dan Dutcher, Vice President for Division Three, joining me here. And first and foremost, thanks for having me out here. I had a wonderful uh, trip, and uh, great to do this in a little bit more of a formal studio. Well, thanks for coming. It's really been a pleasure to have you here with us, Dave. Well, first and foremost, uh, the, the big key for Division Three, when you and I talk, is finding out what the state of Division Three is, as we've affectionately called it over the years, and we're trying something new, doing this at the beginning of the year instead of near the end. Long and short of it, what is the state of Division Three as we head into the 2014-2015 academic year? Yeah, I think Division Three is in a really good place right now. Um, I go back to a membership-wide survey we conducted last spring. It's the first membership survey that we had conducted in five years. Um, the results were very reaffirming uh, for the division. Um, lots of support for the division's philosophy, um, for how that philosophy is put into practice. Um, I think for our legislative standards. Um, and then, interestingly enough, maybe for the first time, we actually asked folks how they felt um, we accomplished our responsibilities in terms of communication. And then, how good a job the governance structure does. Did folks feel they were well represented by their colleagues who serve within the governance structure. And uh, in every area, we received very positive feedback. Um, it, was, uh, it was very reassuring. Um, that doesn't mean the division's not without its issues, because sure. um, certainly we, we, we have issues that we have to deal with. But in general, um, I like to tell folks, with, remind folks we're the largest division. Mm. Um, and it, it's no accident, the D3 model works. Um, it works at the campus level, it works at the conference level, and I think most especially it provides educational value to our student-athletes. 
And, and you talk about the largest division and certainly tackle some of the projects and, and some of the challenges, and we'll, we'll get to those down the road. But when you look at Division Three now and you look at it in the short term and long run, aside for some challenges, is it a, is, is it, can it improve? Is it something that everyone can kind of pat themselves on the back a little bit and, and, and work on making it better? You know, we're, part of what comes with our size um, is diversity and a lot of different um, institutional types, institutional missions, big school, small school, public-private affiliation. Um, there's a lot of diversity, and I think with that diversity comes a continual responsibility to be sure that for all of our member institutions, they have an opportunity to express their concerns, um, to have those addressed within the governance structure, and to be sure that we're doing the best job we can to serve all of our members, just not certain segments uh, of our membership. So that's sort of an ongoing responsibility um, that we have. Of course, a uh, dynamic in the sense that 81 percent uh, is a, is private, and of course, 19 percent right. public. It's always the private versus public scenario. Um, still working as it is. And do you guys get any feedback on that private versus public still? Yeah, I mean, very much. I think folks have become comfortable with the idea that whether you're public, private large school, small school, if you believe in the philosophy, if you are committed to implementing it in practice, there's a place for you within Division Three. One of the big things that obviously everybody's talking about, and if they're not talking about it, they will be shortly, is the budget. Uh, and, and the shortfall that everybody hears about, maybe doesn't see in hard numbers, but knows that Division Three has been told, the, 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 the schools have been told, the, the programs have been told, we have budget shortfall. We have to deal with this budget shortfall, not only in the short term, but in the long term. You guys are out with your, your annual report, which spells it out and right. says exactly what you guys are dealing with, losing seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars $800,000 a year in the championships alone. Before we get in the nitty-gritty of figuring that budget out, just some of the basics that maybe people need to be reminded about. They look at the billions of dollars that the NCAA brings in from Turner and CBS and ESPN and all that. D3 doesn't see that much of it. Yeah, we're, we're very fortunate, though, in the sense that we have a constitutionally guaranteed percentage every year um, off the top of the association's revenue stream. It's 3.18 percent. Um, that's not a large percentage, but the overall pie is so big that that slice equates to about $28 million this, this coming year. That's constitutionally guaranteed, so we're really fortunate in the sense that unlike our member institutions that have to uh, uh, face revenue challenges every year, our revenue is guaranteed. Um, about 15 years ago, the President's Council made a policy decision to allocate um, the, those funds uh, about 75 percent toward our championships program, which is obviously longstanding, uh, and then about a 25 percent allocation toward new strategic initiatives such as the conference grant program, some of our internship uh, uh, programs, uh, student athlete leadership conferences, those kinds of uh, programs that benefit the division as a whole beyond just those schools that get to participate in championships. So every year we have that 75-25% target. We allocate the money uh, accordingly. The revenue shortfall that you referenced, um, that's concentrated in our championships budget. And it's relatively new. It's only been in existence about three years. Prior to that, we were consistently running a championships um, surplus. So obviously the question is, well, well, what happened? What's changed? And I think a couple things to note. Number one, um, travel costs have increased significantly. We're averaging about a 7% annual escalation uh, on the travel side. That obviously is something that's not within our control. Sure. But the championship uh, travel, uh, the travel piece of our championships budget is, is, is significant. Um, our game expense um, costs have escalated annually somewhere around 9 to 10%. That's something that's maybe a little bit more under our control, but something that we clearly uh, need to look at. And then I think another point that's important to look at when, when you're trying to sort of dissect what happened, um, what happened with, this, um, with this surplus is the allocation that we receive under our current broadcast agreement uh, with Turner and CBS, um, our annual escalation is about 25 to 3%. Um, obviously, the overall value of that contract exceeds our prior uh, broadcast agreement. But that prior broadcast agreement, the money was more backloaded. So every year we had an annual escalation of somewhere around 5, 6, 7 percent. 
under the current broadcast agreement, the money was more front-loaded. So our annual escalation is a lot smaller. It's only about 25 to 3%. Um, I was not a math major in college, but, but I think uh, it's sort of fair to point out that if every year your costs are escalating somewhere 5 6 7%, but your revenue is only escalating about 25 to 3%, long-term that business model is not really sustainable. Um, it's been the last couple of years, um, which were the first years under the new broadcast agreement, where sort of all those things have, have come together. The small annual increase, the increased um, costs on the travel side, on the game expense side. So it really required us to take a step back mm -hmm. and deal um, with the problem in a couple of different ways, short term and long term. Yeah. Um, you know, within our committee structure, the group that's, that's really charged with hands-on responsibility for this is our Strategic Planning and Finance Committee. That includes folks from our President's Council, Management Council, and different constituencies, including the Chair of our Championships Committee. And the Strategic Planning and Finance Committee really charged the Championships Committee um, with taking a hard look at our championship expenses and coming up with some short-term solutions. And some of them might catch some people a little bit off guard. Again, it's in the annual report. We'll talk about where you can find it on NCAA.org. But some of those, those decisions seem logical. Some of them might catch some people off guard. Some of them still have to go through a, a convention vote, as it were. But the three basic ones that seem to come from where take a look at administrative, mm -hmm. take a, a look at uh, the costs in general of doing business, right. um, take a look at how bids are allocated. You know, what's the access for those bids? Um, as, as well as, as looking at um, uh, travel parties and the, and the amount of people mm -hmm. you're paying to travel. Some of those seem like no-brainers. Some of them are a little bit more challenging. Let's start with administrative. On the administrative point of view, what are some of the small ways that maybe you guys are trying to tackle that? Well, one example would be right now for some sports, we select on a particular day, let's say a Sunday, we announce it on Monday, and maybe competition begins on Wednesday. Yeah. Um, without, uh, without a greater lag between selection and flights, um, you're, you have very few options available when it comes to flights. Yeah. Um, and you're paying sort of the highest rate that, that you probably can pay, yeah. if not requiring um, you to have to take a charter. And charter costs have exploded. Um, regular sort of list price tickets, th those costs have gone way up mm -hmm. too. So that's just one example, maybe greater uh, time between selection and um, the first contest would make available for us more um, flight options that would probably save us some money. By one estimate in this daily report, you know, this annual report, uh, putting three days in there could save fifty thousand dollars essentially a, a year yeah. in theory, and, 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 so and I think that's a conservative estimate. Yeah, yeah absolutely, I, I really do. So that's one, uh, that's one um, item to look at. Obviously, the the, the sites where contests take place, mm -hmm. um, especially the, the final round contests. If the more geographically centrally located those are, um, the less uh, charter flights are necessary. Um, the more cost effective that is. So those are. Those were a couple of uh, a couple of examples. When it comes to travel parties, some people are probably already going, "Whoa, whoa, you're going to lower the amount of student athlete participating." That's not the case. You're not looking at the student athletes' participation. You're looking at the support staff essentially. So instead of That's bringing right. ten coaches along, you might cut that down to five. That's right, uh, and, and that will that will accrue some cost savings. Um, another significant um, initiative that was adopted was in not increasing, and in fact rolling back by five dollars that per diem that will be uh, uh, allocated toward the to institutions for for the expenses they incur um, in participating in championships. So. At one point, that per diem was scheduled to go up to $100 from 95. In fact, we did not increase, and in fact, rolled the 95 back to 90. Um, overall, that saved us about a million dollars. So um, it wasn't necessarily a popular alternative, but, but the committee felt that it was, that it was necessary. It was a million dollars. Sure. Um, on the flip side of that, too, there's other things like uh, whether there's an honorary gift for the host team. Again, stuff we can look into and, right. and we don't need to get into. But all in all, a lot of those decisions came down to $2.1 million if it all were to pan out. Right. And certainly these are short-term fixes, though. Yeah, and I think that's really important. We've tried to be as deliberative as possible through the process 
and the process is not over yet. Right. So on, that, on the first front, to try to, to be as deliberative as we could be, um, when the Championships Committee received that directive from the Strategic Planning and Finance Committee to go, uh, to go review and, and identify um, possible savings, um, I think they very wisely conducted a survey of the membership which laid out the scenarios, laid out the problems, and asked membership uh, feedback to prioritize what um, savings they might be willing to support versus what savings they would be less willing to support. Sure. And, and ultimately, I think um, the, the message was clear, try to preserve championship access for our student athletes as much as possible. Do administrative changes first if you can, do changes to travel parties um, second, um, but to try to preserve the overall access to championships, especially those access ratios, because those very literally are student athlete uh, opportunities to participate in championships. Access ratio 6.5 to 1 for every bid on a bracket, right. um, counting AQs and, and uh, large bids. Certainly don't want to talk about what the speculation is there. We don't want to start uh, any uh, undue um, concern, but certainly there's ones on the table of expanding that to, to maybe one for every eight or one for every nine. But that is not a simple uh, decision. That's going to take steps along the process and eventually an overall vote. A absolutely. That, the access ratio is legislated, so any change to that access ratio would have to be adopted through membership legislation. And there's no proposal to do that on the docket for this year's um, 2015 convention. But moving forward, what we think will be really important is a broad-based educational effort to be sure our membership understands the entirety of the issue. How do, what are the fiscal problems? What are the challenges? What are the options that are available? Um, none of the solutions will come without trade-offs. Um, the shorter-term solutions that have been adopted at this point um, that, that you referred to, in some sense those represent greater cost sharing for our institutions that are going to participate in championships. We've always tried to achieve the principle of fully funding championships participation, but there may come a point in time where our ability to fulfill that one principle about fully funding championships participation begins to rub up against our ability to provide access to um, the amount of uh, institutions that currently participate. Um, that's the kind of discussion that we'll um, need to have in earnest during our uh, Division Three Issues Forum at the convention coming up in January. We want to be sure that folks are prepared to, to have that discussion. Another, uh, by the way, quickly back to travel parties. I don't want everybody to assume that nobody can, you know, if you're going to cut back your staff to five, nobody else can come. Schools would just have it on them then to have to pay for those. Absolutely, the right. Um, one of the other ones that's on the table that I know has had a lot of conversation, at least over the summer, um, at least come up in conversation, and, and certainly one I heard here was looking at the dues mm -hmm. uh, that, that Division three schools pay. Uh, the number is roughly $900, and it's been that way since 1985, which is a staggering thought uh, that nobody has thought to raise dues in that amount of time. It's both a good thing and maybe a bad thing. But to raise dues across the Division Three, in some senses requires the entire association, if I have that correctly. But there's also ways to maybe be able to do it in just the division. But again, like the access ratio, this isn't a simple fix. This isn't a short-term fix. This is a long-term look. Yeah, I think the idea of trying to identify additional revenue sources that can help address this issue makes a lot of sense. Um, there aren't many revenue opportunities available, but the ability of our Division Three members to maybe provide for more revenue to help address this issue, either through a dues increase or some kind of championship surcharge, I think is an idea that, um, that, that merits some consideration. Certainly when we broached the idea with our President's Council, um, they were astounded that our dues are as low as they are, that they haven't been raised since 1985. Um, when they compare the amount of dues that they're paying to their conferences for conference membership or to other higher ed associations for membership, um, it pales in comparison. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's an idea that, that deserves some, some, some additional consideration. Um, but it would be an idea that we would need to, uh, to navigate through the executive committee because currently right now 
the dues stream goes into the overall association wide revenue pot. It isn't something that's targeted specifically for the division. Might we be able to receive um, that additional revenue directly back into the Division Three budget? Perhaps, but it's something that, that we will need to approach when the time is right. All of this budget talk, short-term, long-term fixes, it's got to be tackled. You guys are on a budget cycle as well here uh, at the association. But more importantly, you've got to look at finding solutions because the money is always going to increase in some capacities to, to run championships. You can't always rely on the traditional revenue sources. So this is a really important time, it seems, to make sure, you know, budget may have some people kind of glaze over, but this has to do with running these championships, and this has to do with making sure you guys continue to give the opportunities to student athletes that you've been wanting to and have been for a number of years. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. It, I mean, the value that we provide back to our member institutions, it's essential. It's why in, institutions decide they want to be members uh, of the NCAA and, and of Division III. We, we've got to be sure that we continue to provide that value to our member institutions. And I think that value resides on the championship side and also on the non-championship side. Um, the prioritization of how those uh, funds are spent and what programs um, are supported, that's where the membership feedback is, is so important for us over the long term. And to keep up with a lot of this, again, the annual report is on NCA.org under the Division Three tab. Uh, I know your governance team is very proud also of the monthly newsletter that you guys send out that kind of keep people uh, up to date on nuances like this or, or even changes to championships or changes to, to uh, information. Just briefly give idea to people how they can actually access that information for themselves. Yeah, we, we've really tried to make more information available on our website. I think it's important to note that the NCAA just renovated, just revised its website. It's much more user friendly. It's much more accessible. Um, if you go to that website, click on the D3 button, there's a pull down menu. You can go to the D3 web page, uh, the governance page, and you'll see links to, for example, the monthly newsletter that you mentioned, which is our attempt every month to summarize what are the hot topics, what are the, um, the key events that have happened uh, during the prior month or that we anticipate during the coming month. Another document that uh, I don't want to uh, neglect is our quarterly newsletter that we send to presidents. It summarizes the actions that took place at the most recent president's council meeting. Um, it's typically no longer than uh, two pages uh, or two sides of one page because you got to be succinct when you're com communicating <laughs> with presidents. Sure. Um, but that's another document that I think we've received a lot of good feedback on. We really want that website to be your first stop when you're trying to access any kind of information related to Division Three, Obviously, we don't discourage folks from contacting us if they can't find what they're looking for, but we're really proud of the amount of information we now have available on our website and how accessible it is. Once again, NCA.org, and, and those of us here will also try and, and promote that stuff. Uh, he's Dan Dutcher, Vice President for Division Three. Once again, Dave McHugh here on the YD3 show. Um, Normally, we talk to you after the convention's taken place, well before we really are taking a hard look at the next convention. Neat opportunity this time to talk to you ahead of the convention in some senses. The 15 items that will be voted on um, by member institutions are, are, present, are ready to go uh, and available again. We won't go into all 15, but one of the big ones that came up was the recruiting side of things. Um, and I think this also kind of goes into budgets, not necessarily just the associations, but certainly school budgets themselves. You guys took a long, hard look at the recruiting practices. You had a work group put together. And I, I found it very interesting to see what you guys came out of, uh, of that. You had nine proposals. You're down to four that will be voted on. Um, some items for expand, expanding social media is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But there's some interesting ones. For example, um, allowing uh, Division Three to reach out to uh, student athletes after they've completed their sophomore year in high school, something that's not allowed till after their junior year. Uh, a, 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 an opportunity to sign a declaration that you're going to a school, a non-binding one, right. I should point out, but something to give a little bit more pomp and circumstance. Uh, a lot of those listening to the group, how do you think some of these decisions will be received, and do you think all of them will even pass? Well, I think the work of the re the recruiting working group did some really difficult um, but but good work and it uh, it spent about two years 
Um, the initial focus tended to be on how to achieve a better work-life balance for coaches, but that conversation quickly evolved into, I think, a broader and probably more relevant issue, and that was how do we recruit more effectively and more efficiently in Division Three? We have limited resources. Um, to a greater and greater extent, it seems that athletics, um, especially at tuition-dependent institutions, that athletics is, is providing uh, a real important link for enrollment and retention. Uh, and so our schools are not interested in limiting recruiting if that also ends up limiting the overall institutional efforts to, to, to recruit and retain a student and body. And that might be one of the surprises. A lot of people out there talking about, hey, you know, Division Three is the only one in recruiting that doesn't have basically dark periods or shut down right. moments where in the calendar, like in Division One and in Division Two, you cannot recruit. It's around holidays. Mm -hmm. It's around certain times of the year. Right. Division Three, it's a wide open calendar. And I think maybe some people are going to be surprised that that's not at the table, and it sounds like it's enrollment driven. Yeah, I, I really think it was. I think it was a desire to retain that institutional autonomy, that institutional flexibility. Um, we still have a lot of part-time coaches in Division Three, for example. Um, for that coach to, maybe the holidays are a good time for that coach to recruit because he or she is off from their full-time position. Um, I think it ultimately was a recognition that given the size and the diversity of, of our division, retaining that institutional autonomy, retaining that ability for schools to help use athletics to, to, to leverage their overall enrollment and retention goals was, uh, was, was of greater importance. Now, that's not to say that the legislation, legislative proposals that came from the, the working group aren't significant. I think they are one that um, we also should mention is the opportunity for institutions to um, conduct uh, an evaluation of prospective student athletes on campus. I yeah, think. To, to quickly let everybody understand, basically you come on campus to visit the campus, they could literally put you through a skill drill uh, to get a better sense of who you are as a student athlete. Right, and, and I think the theory behind that was maybe if it permits coaches to conduct that activity on campus, it may obviate the need for them to um, go off campus and watch that student, uh, prospective student athlete participate in, a, in a, a elite camp, for example. That also sounds like the one, though, that is the most challenging because it does also seem to go against a little bit the idea that the students there to understand about the college, not necessarily try out for a team. Right. I, I would say that is the most controversial of that working group package. Uh, the President's Council sponsoring it uh, in order to permit the membership to have a vote because uh, several of our feedback uh, exercises indicated division-wide interest in that concept, yet um, there are folks who believe that it's contrary to the D3 philosophy, and so the, the council ultimately concluded it ought to be put up for a vote, but they didn't necessarily endorse it uh, for support. We've mentioned three of the four. We'll just quickly mention one of the other items is if uh, a student in high school is involved in a, a tournament that's a three-day tournament and the coach can only make the first day, they don't have to wait until the end of that tournament to talk with them. They would be able to talk to them uh, that right then and there. And that sounded like talking to a former student athlete that you have on your staff, that sounded like that one came back to also the student athletes in high school understanding why coaches weren't permitted to talk to them right. and maybe the standoffishness that that created. Yeah, there, there's definitely a communication issue there that folks didn't necessarily understand why that communication couldn't take place, especially after the prospects were done for the day. For the day right. And there's also an efficiency uh, piece there too where um, allowing a coach maybe to have that contact on a particular day and then move on to another event, um, it's a better opportunity for that coach to, to use his or her time more, more effectively and efficiently. So certainly lots to talk about in recruiting. We won't go any further into it. It will be brought up at the convention. Again, you can read more about it. Love to talk about, you and I have discussed over the last few years about the growth of Division Three. At one point, I think, was it 2020? There was predicted to be 480 potential schools in right. Division Three. Things seem to be slowing down a little bit, whether people realize it or not. Um, what is the status there in the growth of Division Three? Yeah, we have about 450 active and provisional members total right now. Um, we have about 12 schools that are somewhere in that new member process. Um, I think the 
predictions, the growth predictions that we had about 10 years ago were probably a little more uh, uh, aggressive, if you were. They were probably, they, they were probably higher than, than has turned out to be the reality. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that um, the growth that we're currently experiencing is unmanageable. Um, I think the membership committee does a great job of, of, of assuring that the schools that do enter the process and follow through the process are fully prepared uh, to become full and productive and contributing members of, of the division. Um, I think most of the schools that are not already in the association um, um, that are willing to make the commitment to not award athletics aid and make the commitment to sponsoring that broad-based program that we require in Division III. Um, there aren't a lot of schools um, that aren't already members of the association that are maybe in a position where they're going to be willing to make those commitments. Um, and so that, I think, has helped to maybe hold some of the gro projected growth maybe a little more uh, in check. But again, it's a, it's a good model. I think folks understand the benefits that being a member of Division III can bring to their student body, can bring to their student athletes. So there continues to be interest, but it's the bar that you need to get over in order to actually make it as a Division III member, it, it, it's significant. But then at the same time, there may be some changes coming with exactly how a, a school can become Division Three, even shortening the process a year or two, to quote one of your colleagues, if they already are a Division Three type of school, why have them go through the extra hurdles? Yeah, I, I think the, the proposal that will be voted on in January basically says uh, if the membership committee and the management council um, can conclude that you deserve a waiver of that first exploratory year, uh, which is typically an educational fact-finding mm -hmm. year. If it's already clear that, that you really know what you're doing, you're making a conscious decision, you have that fact basis um, uh, already achieved, that you could, um, be, um, you could be considered to, to have that exploratory year waived. That would still leave a four-year provisional membership process, which is a significant amount of time. Um, for schools after the second year, if they're fully uh, meeting all membership uh, requirements, um, they can get that third year waived. So in a sense, you have a five-year process for some, maybe a four, and for a very limited number of institutions, it might be as short as a three-year process, which is still a significant time period. Of course, this whole discussion of growth, I think some people would um, wonder what may be the future when they look at all the major changes going on in Division One, especially with the Power Five conferences on the football side of things. Uh, I was interested in our conversations earlier uh, that you don't think it's going to have a major impact on Division Three. Well, I think Division One's been through some very difficult challenging, complicated discussions of their own over the last year, give or take, regarding their governance structure. Um, the new structure that the Board of Directors approved for Division I uh, at their last meetings in August, um, those are, they're very significant changes. I think first and foremost, the fact that Division I membership is staying together as a division under the Division I umbrella granting an opportunity for more autonomy for the so-called Big Five conferences, yet all of Division I members are, are staying uh, together from a governance perspective. I, you probably can't underestimate the significance of that. Um, I really think from a Division Three perspective, it sort of reinforces the idea that there are issues in Division I, but they're going to be resolved within Division I as opposed to potentially D1 institutions maybe looking to leave the association, which ultimately then could affect um, our overall association-wide revenue stream and by extension, uh, the Division Three revenue allocation. Um, of course, the other thing that Division Three takes pride in is, is, is in its identity initiative, uh, dedicate, develop, and um, I'm gonna miss the third yeah, one, of discover, course. Discover, right, I knew right, I was gonna miss the, right. the, the Discover one. It, it has evolved. Uh, when it first came out, I think a lot of people were like, what's this? Is this just because Division Two decided to do right. something and now you're jumping on the bandwagon? But since then, gained momentum. Um, certainly seems like a lot of Division Three, if not the vast majority, are fully supportive of it. You see the banners, you understand the message at all championships now. 
What's this next stage? What is that as we move forward into this academic year? What are, what's the goal with the initiative now? Yeah, I, I think um, the, the identity initiative has been very successful. The next, in the initial focus really has been at the institutional level. To be sure, our members' schools and their administrators and their student athletes um, understand what it means that that institution is a member of Division III. What does it mean philosophically? Mm -hmm. What does it mean practically from an academic perspective, from an athletic perspective? What does it mean in terms of opportunities for community service and study abroad and those kinds of things? What kind of commitment are you making um, <laughs> to, when you become a member of Division III? I think the next logical step is to um, convey that message more effectively at the secondary school level mm. with prospective student athletes, um, with moms, with dads. Um, there are thousands of student athletes out there competing at the high school level. I forget what the exact number is, millions. Um, but there, there are only about 6% of high school student athletes, of high school athletes who will ever compete at the NCAA, just 6%. And we recognize the fact that most of those student athletes, so more of those student athletes who can participate in Division III, 40% of them, yeah. than in any other division, um, most of those student athletes will not receive an athletic scholarship or certainly a full athletic scholarship. Uh, over a majority of NCAA student athletes as a whole don't receive any kind of athletic aid. Mm -hmm. um, it's that message that we need to convey more effectively at the high school level. What are the realities of the participation opportunities that um, prospective student athletes are looking at? What are the benefits that they can anticipate by participating um, at a Division III institution? The opportunities to have a full integrated experience on the academic side, on the athletic side, um, with community service. If you're looking to study abroad, um, more and more now I think um, employers are expecting that students will have done some kind of an internship or yeah. externship yeah. Uh, in order to receive a job. Well, that's a realistic opportunity if you're a Division III student athlete. Cool. So the benefits that are available um, for our student athletes, the model and what it represents, to be sure that students understand and make a conscious decision that's right for them when they decide um, to participate, that I think is a responsibility um, that we, that we uh, need to, uh, to, to, to more effectively uh, fulfill. And it, I think it's become ever more important for our member institutions given the current climate in higher education. Mm -hmm. um, what you're seeing, especially for smaller private institutions, and in that, uh, that's a it's lion's a share of our Division mm -hmm. III membership, um, is um, a real demographic change in terms of the traditional student base um, in terms of where those students are located, what they look like in terms of gender, in terms of uh, ethnicity, in terms of age. Um, the traditional student base is changing. Um, our ability from a Division III perspective to continue to provide an opportunity that is attractive for prospective student athletes, it's essential. We need to better um, communicate to prospective student athletes the kinds of opportunities that are available to help our schools meet that continuing need to enroll and retain prospective students. And kind of a way back to the recruiting um, work group, it's almost a blanket way of helping at least get the recruiting jump started in some cases that maybe if it were to work and everything is great uh, that the coach is walking in that student maybe already understands about division three absolutely absolutely I, I think this enrollment and retention issue it's the it's the hottest topic in higher education right mm -hmm. now in the Division three model can be a solution to help our institutions address of course that a problem. comparison sheet it's interesting because you are saying oh by the way there's division one and there is division two right but you're pointing out you know, th yeah, these are the three divisions, right? And we are Division Three. Yeah, I'm, every division has, I think, a very strong model. They're different. We want to be sure that folks understand that um, beyond Division One, there are very strong, very attractive benefits to participating in the other divisions, and of course, especially in Division Three. Along that token, along the name of the show, YD Three Show, 
Um, why D3 in your mind? What What is about it? You're, you went to Notre Dame. I mean, right. you know, everyone should know that. Uh, you came from the big school, you know, but now you're, you're a, a big proponent for Division Three. What has been the change in your mind in that sense of being such a, 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 a proponent for this division? And why do you think Division Three is so important, not only maybe to the association, but to schools and to student athletes out there? Well, I really think for Division Three, it's about the focus on the student athlete's educational experience and the integration of athletics into that overall educational experience. Um, sometimes folks talk about a balance which suggests almost competing forces in Division yeah. Three. It's really more about an integration. Uh, I think the, the inherent educational value that um, is provided to our student athletes, that's the, the fundamental reason why Division Three institutions sponsor their athletics programs. It's not because they make money, because no. they don't. And we all like to see fans in the stands, but it's not because there's a public entertainment responsibility. It's really about that recognition and commitment to providing that educational experience through athletics. Um, it's putting students first. Um, to me, that's the essence of the D3 philosophy. And um, that's, I, I, I really think that's the strength of the division. And to summarize a lot of the budgetary things and, and give these student athletes this YD3 experience, yeah, there's shortfalls, there's challenges ahead, but at this point, it's not about taking away the opportunity. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we can work through the, 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 the business end of things, if you will, some of the economic issues, but our fundamental commitment as a division, as an association, to providing that um, educational experience, um, that championships experience, those uh, student athlete leadership and development experiences, that's our commitment to our student athletes and that's, that's not gonna change. As a tenant, as you know of my uh, interviews, I always like to give the guests final word. Any final thoughts you wanna say to either student athletes who are watching, administrators who may be watching, media, um, professors, anybody out there who, who have a passion for Division Three in any way, shape or form, what's your message as we enter this this new year and, and look at the convention coming up in January? You know, I'd like to just uh, encourage folks to not hesitate to remind um, their colleagues who may not uh, understand as well as they should um, that we are the largest division. We have the most member institutions. We have the most student athletes. And again, that's not an accident. It's because of the value that we provide. Don't let folks paint with a broad brush um, by focusing only on Division I football or men's basketball or any other sport that they may be interested in. Be sure that folks understand the full breadth and scope of the NCAA and our student athlete experience and, and, and the, the, the great model that Division Three stands for. And once again, thank you for uh, inviting me here to Indy to have a chance to sit down with you, especially in a new format. Doing it at the beginning of the year, I certainly appreciate it. And uh, we'll look forward to chatting with you down the road and maybe even catching up with you at the convention. It's been a real pleasure, Dave. Thanks again for the opportunity and for you uh, making the trip out here. Absolutely. He's Dan Dutcher, Vice President for Division Three. I'm Dave McHugh. This is the YD3 Show. We'll be back with more on the show right after this. Division Three allows you to be able to give yourself to other things. Not even just participate in them, but really get involved with them if you want to. There's a lot of interaction. Um, it's not just sitting back, taking notes. You're actually doing hands-on things and better preparing yourself for your major. Choosing a Division III school, I've had the opportunity to develop my leadership skills and to be more involved on campus. Division III in athletics you know, affords students the opportunity not only to participate in uh, intercollegiate athletics at a competitive level, but also gives them the opportunity to, you know, engage in the other interests in their campus and in their lives outside of that sport and outside of the academics on the campus. And to have opportunity to have time to join clubs and being able to play basketball, it allows you to just be able to do everything you want to do. I wouldn't change it for the world. Welcome back to the YD3 Show. I'm your host, Dave McHugh. This is a little bit of an audio-only segment uh, for the next topic as we talk about uh, Cortland's uh, football program. Uh, we won't be doing audio-only all that often, but every once in a while, we just have to. Uh, coming up, we're going to talk about uh, Cortland State's football program 
um, which uh, started the 2014 season, believe it or not, with two more donations to the Bone Marrow Registry. And I don't mean just a couple more cheek swabs. I mean guys who ended up being matches, who are part of the program or have been part of the program, who have then made donations to help somebody and their cause. You might re remember last year or know about uh, last year John Stevens, um, who ended up donating to help uh, a girl in California um, whose uh, pretty much life was saved. Uh, Clara Boyle was her name. Um, we'll talk more about his story coming up when we talk to uh, their head coach, uh, Daniel McNeil. But now joined by Andre Green, senior at Cortland State, former defensive standout for the football squad and now a star on the track team. And Andre, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this this bone marrow registry that this football team has has come up with in the last few years uh, certainly has some impressive marks, and uh, we'll talk to the head coach about that in a minute. But just your take on the fact that already five or six uh, guys have been matched up, whether players or coaching staff, and and, and including yourself. Yep, uh, I mean it's pretty pretty exciting that we got five matches already just through I mean we've done it for I think six years and the odds of getting any match period is pretty rare so getting this from our from our football program period is pretty pretty nice of course, some of those have uh, gotten plenty of attention. We'll talk more about John Stevens, who graduated last year with, when we talk with uh, uh, your head coach. But you are one of those matches. Uh, this is all part of a drive you, as a football team, do every spring. And you were telling me the goal is that every player is to get 10 people to swab their cheeks and, and register for this donation. And you're telling me everybody gets those 10 every year? We That's, that's our goal. So, I mean, we, of course, we have a few slackers or something like that, but <laughs> that's, that's, that's the main goal is to get 10 people per person. And that's a lot of people every single uh, every single spring. What what do you do in, in your in your sense of trying to drive people uh, to, to register? Well, I mean, we do it during spring fling, and we have a whole bunch of things going on on campus, so the students are already out and everything like that. So, and we're mainly at our core union where we have our registry. So we ask people there, or we ask, well, we, we know prior to the spring fling that we're going to do it anyways. So we get our friends and like our roommates or stuff like that. And then we just grab random people sometimes. <laughs> you were telling me that you uh, register every year, even though once you're registered, you're registered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, People will most likely do it if you're doing it. Um, if I were to see that someone asked me to donate and they're not donating, I mean, I, I would be less likely to do it. So, When you first registered, how much did you really know about this bone marrow registry and, and what its implications are? I knew very little. I knew that you sometimes you had to go under, and that's all I knew, like, usually patient has like leukemia or some cancer so that's all i bet i know i knew very little of the can of the bone marrow at all you've been registered for a couple of years you finally got a call and i say finally the, the the chances of getting a call are pretty slim as bone marrow is a very specific uh and very um difficult match you get a call mm -hmm. in may what was your first reaction when you got that call i was kind of uh, overwhelmed kind of like, I don't know, like kind of like winning the lottery. Really? Not, went like literally, but I was just, I was walk, literally walking to uh, track practice and I got the phone call and I was mind blown that I was a potential, I was a potential match. I wasn't a match yet. Right. It was a, it was a potential, so it was very kind of emotional, but very I'm Sure, but so you were excited about that opportunity? Yeah, very excited. Um, the next steps with this is obviously bo uh, blood testing and finding out if the other match is truly a match. How much did you know about the process early on? How much did you know about the potential match early on? I had no idea. I, um, I don't know. I, I didn't think that I would be a match at all. So. 
So you go through the blood work, you wait on the process, um, yeah. you, you get the call in May. Um, yeah. you, what yeah. time? When did you find out you were officially a match? Uh, June, okay. end of June. And did you know who that would, and not the person specifically, but how your match would help somebody? Yep. Mm-hmm. Did you find and that I, out then? Did you find it out later? They told me how old the girl was, and then they told me what she had, which was a rare anemia. I have uh, the whole thing in my pamphlet, in like a pamphlet somewhere. Sure. But I Googled it and everything like that, and like the life expectancy that she had, it was like 8 to, t- eight to 12. Wow. And then if she did have the procedure done, it would ho- hopefully go up to 30. So, Did you have any reservations about doing it? It's very common for that to happen. Um, but did you have any reservations about stepping up and, and going through with this? Mm-mm. No, I was, our, I mean, it's, it's scary at first, obviously, but like something that I feel like anybody should do if they have the chance to. Of course, uh, you end up going um, for the the the, the red, or I should say, the donation uh, on mm-hmm. September 10th, uh, going to Upstate University Hospital there in Syracuse, New York. Uh, how long was the process? What was it like uh, that day at the hospital? Um, well, the people giving uh, the nurses and the women doing the donation with me, they were very nice. Caesar took forever. <laughs> it was about seven, eight hours. Wow. But and I had to say, I mean, I slept two hours, but yeah, I'm hooked up in two IVs in each arm. Gotcha. And it just and I can't move them at all. So, but it just takes a long time. And then prior to that, you have to get five shots uh, to enhance the bone marrow in your blood. Hmm. That though, that was the worst part. It just made me achy and sore all the time. That's all. How long was how how long or a course of time were those shots? Five days before this procedure, so I started it September 5th. So you got a shot pretty much every day? Yep, every day. Gotcha. Um, and, and one, I think some people may not be aware, it, it can be just as simple as a couple IVs being hooked up. There's no major mm-hmm. procedure necessarily. Nope. Mm-hmm. So a simple yep. cheek swab can result in a pretty simple uh, donation, as it were, if you are a match. Have you gotten any update on whether the donation has been successful, or they kind of keep you out of the and keep you in yeah, the dark on that? Yeah, they keep me in the dark for now. Um, I told them that I would want notifications if the patient were how how she was doing or not. So oh, okay. I'm just hoping that everything works out. They give you some kind of timeline on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She said within the month. Oh, so. great. Okay, so you don't have mm-hmm. to wait too long. No. Uh, in the meantime, um, is this kind of changed your approach on what might happen this spring if you are still involved in the uh, in the the efforts to get more to register? Um, well, not to um, obviously not. I'm not, I'm not on the football team right. anymore. My injury, but through my track program, I would get try to get all, the, all of the track team to at least get somebody for themselves to go donate as well. And that's uh, over a hundred people. So mm. hopefully. I can get a few people from there. That'd be pretty impressive, to say the least. Is this uh, kind of something that's talked about uh, on campus? Yep. Uh, I'm at, I, through the athletic program, it's pretty known. Like, everybody knows about it. And I'm not sure about, like, the campus and, like, the like, students. But athletically, we do it. Like, everybody knows about it. So... Well, I'm pretty impressed uh, with your efforts. Of course, Coach Dan McNeil, uh, the the impetus behind all this, we'll talk to him coming up here shortly about this. Uh, quickly, student athlete, uh, former football standout, as we pointed out before, an injury stopped your football career, but you're still involved with track, uh, long jump, and javelin. Uh, what's it like to be a student athlete at Cortland? Uh, I mean, it's pretty nice. I, I don't, Cortland's not very big. Right. So. The transition from my hometown to here was very, very similar. My head coach went, was an alumni from Cortland, played under Coach Mack as well. Sure. So it was it's nice. It's why Division Three. Uh, what was the, what was the impetus to go Division Three? Uh, just the more just the connection mm-hmm. I was with my play, with the players that I met, the brothers that I've become. Uh, I, gotten out of the program and just it's close to home too so but 
what are your goals right. this uh, what are your goals this uh, coming uh, track season? I know you're, you're somewhat involved as it is, but what do you hope to accomplish yeah. by the end of the season? Uh, make it back to nationals, indoors and outdoors, and hopefully become an All-American. So. Very main goal. Well, I'm sure you'll uh, strive to that pretty nicely. Uh, quickly, before we let you go, what is your major and what do you hope to do with it? Uh, I'm a criminology major. I plan on going to social work. I would love to become a cop. Uh, I've taken a few exams already, but social work, I love working with little kids, so that mm-hmm. would be great. Oh, great. And it's appropriate that you end up helping out an eight-year-old girl with your bone marrow donation. So, Andre, thanks so much for joining us here on the YD3 show. Certainly appreciate it. Congratulations on uh, what has been, I'm sure, a successful uh, career at Cortland. you got a little bit more of your year left to go, obviously. Um, Thank you for joining us and talking about the bone marrow registry as well. And, And good luck as you finish out your career. All right, thank you. Thank Andre Green from Cortland for joining us to talk about this bone marrow registry that his team or his former team and now hopefully his track squad are taking part in. Pretty amazing to think that these these football players and student athletes at Cortland are going out there and getting more and more people registered. And it's, again, a simple cheek swab to take care of that. Of course, this entire thing um, was started by head coach Dan McNeil, who's a 1979 grad at Cortland. Um, and he now joins us to talk about why this is so important. Coach. Yeah, great to be here. I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, this is a, certainly a, a noble effort, as it were, um, but one that certainly seems to resonate with the Cortland football program and maybe even the Cortland community as well. Give us a little bit of a sense of w- why Bone Marrow uh, Registry and and why this effort in upstate New York. Well, it, it, for me, uh, the influence started with uh, uh, Andy Talley, uh, the great uh, uh, football coach at Villanova University. He was my mentor. I was his defensive coordinator and assistant football coach for 15 years down there. And, uh, you know, we all look uh, to have, you know, uh, get our young men involved in service because that service element, it just in, it, it, it ingrains in a, a strong culture. And that culture, obviously, is the resolve. It's the fortitude. It's everything that says good things about who we are and how we continue to build the, the fabric of our teams. And he, at that time, knew the daunting numbers of survival from some forms of, uh, of cancer. And then the, the only real um, uh, success or hope there was a, a, a potential match in a bone met marrow met registry and then the donation of one to another to be the hero and a lifesaver. So he decided to take that, that mission on uh, singularly as the, as the Villanova football program and their cause. And, you know, really started out where you had to, you know, uh, you, had to, you had to have a blood draw. And, and now, uh, now they can do it with just a cheek swab. So things have advanced uh, with regards to the ease uh, of, of this registry. Um, and, you know, as it grew there, uh, people came and said, how can we continue to broaden this thing? And then he reached to the people he knew within the football community and said, let's make this a college football um, a cause. And, and many, many people joined it. I was happy to join it as the head football coach here because of my familiarity. Uh, and then, you know, it just blossomed here. Our, our young men really embraced it. And then, you know, uh, it, it's kind of neat to, that the dragon's blood has really then put an awful lot of hope and, and actually even solved some, some lives, which only stimulates the, you know, that cause and, and, and then our profound involvement. Yeah, they say Coach uh, Tally responsible for about 30,000 registrants just uh, in the program alone and 45 with everybody else. Uh, 45,000. Of course, you, you mentioned the, the success rate. <laughs> He'd probably be a little bit jealous of the fact that six matches in the five years that you've been doing this at Cortland, uh, Andre Green and your assistant, they began the, the latest uh, two to join that. Of course, the one that got the most attention recently was probably uh, John Stevens, uh, your former linebacker. What does it mean to have those kinds of stories and that kind of success with this registry? It, does it, it does it kind of drive home the point even more? Well, you know, it, it, it's like any marvelous uh, story 
uh, of sharing, you know, sharing what is most important uh, in, in life, and, and that is the hope of survival. You know, can you can you just imagine uh, being on the other end and in, in, in having that news delivered to you and then knowing that you have to find a match for your survival? And somewhere out there is hopefully that angel or that hero who will then step forward, you know, after finding out they are a match and then go through the procedure. Uh, there's nothing easy about this process, but the commitment is absolutely wonderful. And the result for John Stevens and for some others, that, that can you imagine getting that call? And, and so that was the the wonderful aspect of the story because it actually happened for a, a very young infant uh, child in the West Coast. And so e- anywhere in the world that you could have that kind of impact, you know what I mean? An East Coast, West Coast connection, uh, a football player saving an infant, and, and then, you know, the, the unbelievable, Unbelievable out uh, gratitude of, of a parent uh, and parent. So, and then and then saved his life. You know, I mean, they they've got a connection they'll always have. And and then the outpouring and the continual build of you know people saying what a wonderful story, which it is. And, and that just continues to build. And then you have another young man who hits a match, and another young man, and another young man. And those con- stories continue to build upon it. And you take tremendous pride in, in how you in you know and how your program then has impacted uh, the specific lives of those who are in peril and then uh, the hope that your your involvement does for for the many others that might. Andre Green uh, mentioning that um, he was elated uh, when he got the phone call, that he practically was walking on cloud nine uh, shortly after that, uh, that phone call and was more than willing to take the steps forward to help out whoever he has helped out. Uh, the eight-year-old girl is all we know, obviously, at this point, just due to constraints, which are un- certainly understandable. Uh, Andre also talks about the fact that you challenge everybody on the team, 10 people to register every spring during your push to do it during the spring fling. How successful have the guys gotten at getting that 10? Uh, we've we've registered on average uh... – Oh man, I think last year it was it was in the 200. So hmm. you know, uh, it, it, not everybody can get 10 total. You know, 10, sure. 10 times 100 is you know uh, is way up there, and, and it's not easy to get young people right. uh, who are a lot are more still in that individual mindset on a campus as opposed to understanding the love of a parent. You know what I mean? Parents mm-hmm. jump right into this. Families jump right into this thing, especially those connected and having, knowing somebody, maybe it's a loved one that that, that would have really needed, you know, that, that aspect. Uh, but they go out in our community and the kids pile in because, hey, a football player has asked me, to be involved and 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 I and I think that just that request and that responsiveness is that's got to be a prideful thing for the young man you know what I mean they're stepping in and they're swabbing their cheek for the for the eventuality that man maybe they can be that hero and, and isn't it wonderful as you say that you know uh, how excited that that Andre was uh, and everybody processes a difference and somebody has to show them the way I still remember John Stevens walking into my office and he was a little ashen you know what I mean <laughs> A little sure. white and say, Coach, I just want you to know uh, I've got a call here, and and I'm like going, man, John, what a wonderful, what a wonderful thought process. But there has to be some courage on your part because you, it's the unknown. It's not knowing, you know, how this will all fell, fell out. And I said, you got to feel comfortable with that. You know, obviously from a coach's standpoint, you hope that your warrior is going to step forward and be the hero. And he gave it a very. He already had his mind wrapped around it, but it's the, you know, what's going to happen to me kind of a thing certainly takes over with everybody. And then he got involved and he found out how really simple, you know what I mean? Yeah, you know, yeah. Simple it, it is when you when you put it in the context of saving another person's life. And then he came back and he delivered his news to the team and they all watched the event uh, unfold. And so all of a sudden, you know, more kids, their hands are going up, and I hope I'm chosen. And 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 good for him that he started sure. it in that manner, and the success came through in that manner. Well, and John Stevens, uh, two different stories also with Andre Green. Uh, Stevens having the more complex uh, anesthesia version, whereas Andre Green 
Uh, it was a more of a simple, and I, I say that term loosely, um, yeah. blood draw, as it were. Uh, John Stevens also got registered with his family while they were on a recruiting trip. I mean, the influence yeah. of this certainly isn't just to the team and your immediate community. You're, if you're getting recruits to be able to swab their cheeks as well. Well, you know, when we bring them in, we say, this is who we are. You know, you've joined the Red Dragons, and this is our cause. This is one of the things we take great pride in. And so a young man has to process, all right, I'm committed, I care, you can trust me. And so a lot of kids just jump in as team members. And, you know, I think there's probably some influences there just being a part of that kind of caring community. And and so good for us. But ultimately, it does come down to to the warrior. You know what I mean? Uh, and we pride ourselves in, in that warrior mentality, those guys that want to. If you feel you have to do it, then it's more in the victim side of things, and and, sure. and and we get that those 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 people will probably be standing on the sidelines. But you know, you just don't have many of those kind of people in our program. We take great pride in that. How do you how do you see this um, evolving? How do you see this? Um, I mean, it's it's now spread to many campuses. Obviously, Coach Talley at Villanova has has influenced mm-hmm. that. Um, other campuses have uh, similar drives. How have you seen this spread? Wow, it uh I, I was just fortunate again to be at Villanova when the statistics were just like one in a hundred, you know? Mm-hmm. Or or just it's not good. There's no there's not a lot of hope there, you know? And now I I today in this day and age, just because people step forward because there's a segue for them to say, Yeah, I'll be involved. Uh good cause. Let me be involved. And that registry has built one by one, hundreds by hundreds, to the point where, you know what? The statistics are pretty good now. If you need a bone marrow uh, transplant, you got a good chance. There's a good chance. And, and, and so, you know, like I talk our kids about tendencies, you know what I mean? It's a, a tendency at 60%. Shoot, that ain't, you know, I, I don't yeah. like that tendency. Let's get it up to 90%, you know what I mean? And that's a real tendency for us. And so that's what I see happening. And, and so you always wonder, uh, uh, nobody spends time thinking, all right, where are my influences in life? You know what I mean? But certainly being attached to, to Andy Talley has, has, has enriched my life in terms of the cause, not only this cause, but many other things and the influences of I, if people have touched. And then joining that is now, you know, uh, being the head football coach and having this conversation with you about the warriors and the, the, that have, are in our program that have gone on to commit to saving other people's lives. These are guys willing to run into the building, you know, yeah. when it's on fire. So, so uh, I, I just take great pride in, in being, you know, the, the head football coach of these warriors. And, and how, what do you hope this instills in your young men, if not the young men and women in the entire Cortland program? Yeah, obviously, you know, being a bone marrow donor is one win, one way of instilling something. But what do you think the bigger picture is? You know, I, I think the bigger picture is is really the the uh, just the 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 manner of the cause. Get in the game. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the game here is life. The game of life. Understanding that you cannot be. You can be choose to be a bystander. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But what's sharing? You know, where what are you really sharing uh, in, in that context? And what is going to be coming back to you? And and that is probably the best thing about this sport. It's it's really all about a service. I'm a, I'm providing a service to my players. You know, we want the best for them. And then they start to connect and say, man, I want to serve this cause. And then when everybody is on that kind of a page, wow, it's just a powerful, powerful thing to be a part of. And, and now the scope of it is, is, is national. You're right. He's, uh, we're, we're part of something that is, that is not only saved lives, but potentially saving lives and a part of a bigger, bigger sharing community. So that's what you get. It only emboldens who we are, what we talk about. And, and, and we're men of action, and, and, and these are the right actions. Uh, if you want to be a donor, uh, you could, the easy way to get information is go to be the match.org on the website. And I bring that up more in particularly because one of the featured pictures slash stories on their front page is John Stevens and Clara Boyle under the Give Now um, bubble, as it were. It's a great picture of the two of them clearly at Cortland's uh, stadium. 
Um, so again, be the match.org and coach, I'm sure people can find rallies and, and registries all over the, the area, and especially up in the Cortland area, along with you guys in the spring. Yeah, I would say everybody, no matter where they are, whenever, where they're listening, uh, there's so many colleges right now <laughs> and, and that are on this, uh, this registry that it usually in the springtime is when we're real active because, you know, you can focus on these kind of things and, and, and these kind of surround them with their spring football activities and, and make it a, a little bit of a fest and fan fest. So uh, I hope everybody gets involved and, and, and then the registry, the chances become 100%. You certainly inspired myself. I'll probably be looking for my own registry here soon. Sure. Uh, Coach, you'd be remiss if we didn't at least talk about the team. I know you guys are off to a start you didn't really hope for, 0-3. Uh, I know it's a bit of a tough topic, so I will make it quick. Uh, mm -hmm. But how, uh, how are things uh, up there with the Red Dragons? What do you hope for the rest of the season? Well, you know, the, 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 it's, it, the expectations here, you know, uh, as in any program, is that winning really defines you? You know mm -hmm. what I mean. And, and yes, it's it, it, for us. It's the games. Uh, everybody wants to win the game and be on the on the on the on the top side of it. Uh, we've dropped three games now to uh, you know within a touchdown grasp, and you know a little bit of uh, controversy at the end of the games where they could easily. It's not a stretch to say that we we very likely could be two and one. I you know I I can't say that about the Morrisville game because it didn't work out in that manner. But you know again it was very very close. So the kids are warriors. They're worrying about it. Uh, there's a lot of frustration in being zero and three. We haven't been there yeah. uh, ever in the past here. Uh, in, in this rain, but you know what? Uh, there, there is a resolve. There is a, a fortitude. There is a pretty good fort uh, here in 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 Cortland, and and there's a good attitude. And so we just need to get on and, and, and get a win under our belt, and then you know that confidence will continue to spur other good things here. Well, uh, I've seen you guys plenty of times in person in the playoffs. Hope you guys make a rally to return there. A home away, home away, home away type schedule. Very rare these days. Um, well, hopefully good luck to you guys the rest of the way. And again, congratulations on what is certainly a successful bone marrow registry. I appreciate you taking the time to join us here on the YD3 show. Yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for visiting about the, the Red Dragons. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks again to Coach Daniel McNeil, Coach Mack, as he is affectionately known, up at Cortland, um, and talking about the, the great effort started by Coach Talley at Villanova, but certainly pushed on very nicely at Cortland. Get in the game. Save a life. National Marrow Donor Program um, done by Cortland, and six in the last five years have been matches and have made huge impacts, and uh, Coach McNeil should be applauded for his efforts, his team should be applauded for their efforts, and the Cortland community should be applauded as well. Again, if you want more information, if you're not sure where you might be able to find a registry in your area or you'd like to somehow donate, be the match. Dot org is where you go to. When we come back, we wrap up our first episode of the YD3 show. Thanks again to Coach McNeil and Andre Green for joining us. We'll be back with more right after this. I know sports is important, but having the academic part along with it is a big plus. I've discovered in myself, you know, a, a newfound ability to overcome adversity at all different angles. At a Division three school, school is really shaped around you developing yourself as a complete individual. The end result, in my mind, is you just become a very well-rounded person. Before I came into college, I didn't really think I'd be able to balance so much. It helps a lot that you have a family with your team that can guide you. With the D3 school, there's a lot of time for other opportunities. The coaches expect a lot of you during soccer, but after soccer, that's your own personal time. To really find out who you are and other opportunities that you can pursue. By balancing all of my interests, basketball, my leadership skills, and academics, I'm able to better prioritize my life and to manage it. What makes D3 special is the ability to participate in my team and within the broader community. The perfect ending to a perfect season. Being a D3 student athlete has completely expanded my life. I learned how to lead. I really found a voice. What time is it? It's, it's more about the experience rather than just a sport itself. Without the experience of being a Division III student athlete, I wouldn't be the person who I am today. NCAA Division III. Discover. Develop. Dedicate. 
So there you have it. The first YD3 show is, is taken care of for September. We'll be back with another one coming up in October. Stories to be determined. If you want more information on the Cortland story or more information on what Dan Dutcher talked about, we will send those links out and, of course, provide links as well. Always go to NCAA.org if you want to look up, for example, the annual report that the NCAA has put together. Again, we call on you to tell us great stories of student-athletes, coaches, opponents, and the like who may be making an impact not only on the fields and courts where they play, but of course as well in their communities, their schools, etc. There are so many stories, we're not going to be able to cover them all, but we will certainly do our best to highlight some of the best ones out there. Again, use the hashtag YD3. You can also email me at dave.mchugh at d3sports.com. We'll also try and do a little bit more video, as obviously the Cortland one was, did not feature that ability, but we will work on that for the future as well. And if anybody out there has done a video story on one of these student-athletes, we're happy to actually feature that instead of having me ask all the questions. That'll do it for the September version of the YD3 Show. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope you got something out of it and given an idea of what we're going to cover on this show. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you in a few weeks with the October version of the YD3 Show.